Good morning. If you guys want to have a seat, you guys are so welcoming. It's amazing. I love that you guys love each other. <laughs> it's awesome. So, good morning, everybody. My name is Mike. I am the youth pastor here at this church. I, I started about two weeks ago, so if I'm a new face to you, don't worry. You're a new face to me. I, I would love to meet you after service if I haven't already, and if I have met you before, don't worry. I, I may have already forgotten your name. There's so many of you, but it's it's a pleasure to be here, so oh, I love you, Sunday. All right, so a little bit about youth ministry. Yesterday, we went to a youth rally at C3 Church in Portsmouth. I got absolutely pummeled. I don't normally have these marks on my face, but we we did a jousting competition between grown men and women. Uh, it was all men. And it, it oh, man, I went against a guy that was the size of Pastor Ken, and I am so competitive, and I refuse to give up. So I'm there, I'm like, I can take this guy, no problem. Uh, I'm holding this like joust that's full of dense pillows, basically rocks. And, and as soon as they started it, it was just like, bang, I get hit in the face and then it didn't stop. I got hit in the face for about 30 times. I maybe hit the guy about once. I got destroyed in front of about 50 teenagers. So that's why I have these marks on my face. <laughs> Hopefully it makes you laugh. But as I go through and try to talk about these things, if I sound confusing, that's why my brain is soup. <laughs> So, so I help out in, in youth ministry, and it's honestly a pleasure because you have some of the best teenagers ever. I, I'm so honored. I, man, we went, I, I'm going to brag on him because he's here in the service, but Russell, we, we had a, a service at, at night, and God just poured his spirit out, and Russell was praying with other kids, and I'm so proud of you, buddy, for doing that. It was so awesome. I saw God impact kids, and I, I've been to a lot of youth services, but it, it was it was beautiful. I wish you guys could have seen it, but I think you'll see the fruit of it in the lives of these teenagers as the day goes on. So, yeah, if you have a teenager or you know a teenager, please tell them about youth group. They need to have an encounter with God. I believe that's what will change their life forever. And, and, you know, regardless if they remember the words that I speak, I, I hope that they remember the, the words that God speaks to them. That's really all it's all about, is them knowing God and making him known in this world. But it starts with one encounter. So if you know a teenager, please, <laughs> please plug them in. We're, we're here 6.30 to 8.30 every single Friday. Um, for tithe and offering this morning, you guys are already here, and, and I love it. Don't even have to call you forward. Just want to pray for offering. Um, God, <laughs> he's so amazing. He's blessed me in so many ways, and I, I, I could spend an entire probably month up here talking about all the goodness that God has poured out on my life. And he's got so much in store for you. And it's an honor and a privilege to give back to the kingdom of Kings this morning. So let's pray that God will bless the giver and the sower. God, I thank you um, for the seed that you've sowed in our life, the seed of salvation, the seed of faith, and any provision that you've ever given us, God, we consider an honor to give back to you, to meet the needs of others, to meet the needs of your church. But, but just to put our, our money where our mouth is to put our treasure in heaven and not to, on here in this earth. So, God, I pray that you would bless the sower, that you would give seed to them as they sow into your kingdom, we pray. Amen. All right, so I have a couple of announcements for you guys. We have a summer kickoff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, this is a time where we celebrate the achievements and the accomplishments of those who have graduated. So, we're going to celebrate the 8th graders and the 12th graders. And... To be honest, if they've never come to youth group before, but you know someone who's graduating, I'd love to celebrate them regardless. We're going to have a cookout. There's going to be some skating. Some kids have some scooters. We're going to have a barbecue out back in the church, and it's really just going to be a party. So I'd love to see some teenagers there. If you know someone, please invite them. There's going to be a barbecue, games, and prizes. Outside of that, we have a work day coming up June 3rd for Camp Muddy Waters. It's all hands on deck, man. The kids are the next generation, and they are the ones who are going to impact this nation for God. And this is an opportunity for you to get involved in their life in a way that you may not have been able to before. Through your hands and feet, we're going to be setting up sets. We're going to be designing the experience that these kids are going to have during a week at this church at Camp Muddy Water. So I'd encourage you, 
please come. Whether you're in your 80s or you're 10 years old, please come. We need your help, and we'd love to do this together. Camp Muddy Waters, it's science lab themed, and that is going to be June 10th through the 14th. It's $10 per kid, and $10 can really change a life. Like, it's crazy that it's 10 bucks, but that can change a life. So if you know a kid, we're going to have invite cards for the event. I'd encourage you to grab a few of those and, and give them to the families that you know to have children. It's for ages 4 through 13. God can change a life from a young age, and he can do it through your invite. So please, please invite Please. Outside of that, we have a Father's Day picnic. <laughs> fathers are amazing. They're awesome. <laughs> fathers are so good. In a culture that where it seems like there's not a lot of fathers, we want to celebrate fathers as a church. And if you are a father or you have a father, this is a t We all have fathers, but <laughs> if you don't have a father, I don't know if you're growing in a test tube or something, but Invite your father to church. If you're a father in this church, we want to celebrate you. There's going to be a picnic after church, and we just love to see you there. And outside of that, I have nothing else to say to you except welcome Pastor Ken, and I'm so honored and privileged to have him preach this morning. Don't you just love that guy? I'll tell you, I'm so jealous. He's so skinny. I told him the other day, I said, I bet you have to run around in the shower just to get wet. <clears throat> I think his pajamas only have one stripe. <laughs> Anyways, looking forward to a great tenure with him on staff here. We're going to have a lot, a lot of fun. Um, first of all, I want to start off by thanking everyone who showed condolences for me and, and my family, my sister Carol and the other ones. Uh, my brother John went home to be with the Lord on Mother's Day, totally unexpected, just dropped dead of a heart attack. And um, so we're going to be going down next weekend for the funeral in uh, North Carolina. So again, thank you for your, uh, for your concern and prayers for us. We really, really appreciate it. Speaking of prayer, uh, as you know, we've been really raising the bar in this church about prayer. And we've been doing 21 days of prayer. And we've been doing 24-hour prayer clocks and nights of worship and prayer. And um, we were thinking about getting ready to do another one when this came out from the Assemblies of God. And this is called Pray for America starts June 5th and goes for 30 days to July 4th, and they already have all the prayer topics. So I said, hey, rather than reinventing the wheel, we're just going to buy a bunch of these. We're going to buy like 200 of these so everyone can have one of these, and then we're going to be posting them every, every day on our Facebook page as well, um, and just joining uh, the Assemblies of God nationally, having 30 days of prayer. It, you know, this is really what we need. Churches have been program-oriented, and we're trying to reach culture with our programs, and not that programs are bad, but without the anointing and the presence of God and the moving of God's spirit, we're really not going to see what we need to see in order to turn things around. But regardless of the history of this nation, what way it goes, um, it's all about redeeming people and seeing souls come to Christ. And so whether things are going great or whether they're going horrible, our object, our mission is in the redemption business and seeing people come to Christ. Amen. Okay, so you're probably looking at this um, slide saying, what in the world is this all about? I'm um, going to get into that right now. But, you know, here's something interesting. You know, we all hear the, the Lord, and sometimes we hear things. Whenever I see a pizza, I always hear two voices right off the bat. One says, go ahead and have that pizza. And the other one says, you heard him have that pizza. Um, so... I met a guy this week, I kid you not, I met a guy this week who is a, um, uh, a, a limousine driver, and he hasn't had a customer in 25 years. He's worked all that time and has nothing to show for it. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. Um, that's what happens when I'm one week out of the pulpit. Um, I am going to ask again for prayers for Darlene and I. We've got to, I don't know if it's sinus infections or what, but it just doesn't want to let go. I'm still at about 80, 85%. And um, so just keep us in prayer. I really like to feel better because my mind is sharper and we get more things done here. Um, right now, I just feel like I'm you know, in a tin can or something. But tin can or not, God is good. And so uh, we're doing a study out of the Gospel of Mark. We've been going chapter by chapter, kind of going through the chapter quickly, giving you a quick synopsis of what's going on, and then taking something out of that to preach on. And so, um, so here we are. We're in chapter 10. 
and we're going to knock this chapter off today. So the very first thing is from verses 1 through 12, is Jesus does a teaching on divorce. And it's interesting because in this culture at this time in Israel, all a man had to do to divorce his wife was to publicly say, I divorce you three times and a certificate of divorce would be given. So, and that could be for anything from unfaithfulness to burning dinner. I mean, it it could be anything. All they'd have to do is say, I divorce you. The wife would take that as a warning. I divorce you two strikes. I divorce you three strikes. You're out. And so this is where this conversation is going to come that we're going to come back and look at it. But it's interesting that, you know, the whole topic of divorce, Jesus really puts that in a nutshell. And he says, it's because of the hardness of your heart. Um, And so, wow, it really it really hits us hard when we hear that. Right. And it's interesting, too, that when Jesus wants to really get to the bottom of an issue, he always goes back to the book of Genesis. He goes back to in the beginning. And and, and so we're going to come back to this because that's actually the the section I'm going to, to preach on. But it's interesting. Again, in Mark's gospel, we see how things are connected. It's not just random things. And so the next thing you have is Jesus blessing the little children in verses 13 through 16. Um, because marriage produces children, right? And the healthier a relationship is, the healthier the children are. But we live in a time right now where we have this woke culture that is absolutely declared war against children. I mean, the whole abortion industry from conception, some states right now are passing laws that are from conception to crowning. Now, if you don't know what crowning is, that's actually when the head starts coming out of the cervix, right? That's like the birthing process has begun, and they're like, they can still commit abortion at that time. And then we have this whole climate fear mongers that, you know, and we've heard this. I mean, I remember back in the 70s, right? In the 70s, we were having an ice age. We were all going to freeze to death. In the 80s, it was the ozone layer is going to kill us all. In the 90s, it was, you know, global warming. We were all going to be under a flood, you know. 2000, it was the uh, carbon footprint. And, you know, uh, and then it was global warming again. But then we had a couple of really bad winters. So they said, well, it's just climate change. And I don't know about you. You know, I'm, I'm 64, almost going to be 65. And in my experience, I've always seen that the climate changes, right? We live, especially in New England, right? So you have all of these things going on. Um, And and you know what? This has led, that combined with COVID has led to a epidemic of young kids on antidepressants. And it's very, very sad. Very, very sad. And then you've got the whole trans culture and the hormone blockers and the mutilation of children with castration or double mastectomies or things like that. And, you know, when they're pumping hormones and the kids are stopping hormones, they don't understand that hormones are the body's chemical messengers. Hormones are what give the chemicals in our body the messages to do what to do in our bodies. And so it's really frightening to see what's going on. And I just want to show you a quick video of a woman who transitioned into so, a man. You know, we need to hear the other side of the argument of people that are detransitioning and saying, listen, it is hell on earth. I wasn't happy. I thought that was the problem. I went through this routine and I wasn't, I still wasn't happy, right? Because we know that happiness doesn't come from our externals. It comes from our internals. It comes from our relationship with Christ. And so it's very, very sad to see what's going on in our culture. And I understand parents back this because they're concerned about the fear of suicide, Right. Kids feel like they're messed up and they're but there. But there's therapy and there's help for that rather than just saying we're going to support you in, in you know, what culture is telling you to do. And then we've got this drag queen ep- epidemic, which they're not happy unless they have access to children, which is pedophilia. You know, uh, you're hearing uh, Governor DeSantis come under attack saying he's a fascist. He's banning books. Do you know some of the books that they're banning? One of the books is, is for children. It's for, you know, seven, eight, nine year olds. And it tells them that, hey, if you have an encounter with a man in a bathroom and he touches you and do things to you, it might make you feel weird or uncomfortable. But after a while, you'll probably get used to it. Do you know what we call that? We call that grooming. We call prepping them for something that is not natural. It's absolutely sinful. And parents, you need to be aware. Then we also have the sex trafficking of children. Do you know that our government is not talking about this at all? But do you know that there are over 70,000 illegal children that have come over the border that Oops, we don't know where they are. We've lost them. And so the whole Southern border issue, you know, I always tell you, I don't tell you what to vote or who to vote, but I do tell you, vote your values, right? And there's some things that we absolutely need to take a stand. Jesus was indignant about them saying, 
don't let the little children bother Jesus. And he was like, no, let them come to me, right? Let, and, and I agree with what Mike just announced, you know, the, the Camp Muddy Waters and all these things. Let kids come. I know some parents right now and grandparents that their kids want to be in church. And because of their own stupidity, they don't go to church. They're literally holding kids back from having a relationship with Jesus. I would not want to be them on Judgment Day. I just really wouldn't. I just think that's horrible. So we come out of the situation. Jesus teaches on divorce. And then he talks about you know, uh, children, and they need to be able to come to Jesus. And then it goes right into the rich young ruler from verses 17 to 22. And what we see in this section is that he was sincere, but he was sincerely wrong. And there's a lot of people that fall in that category, right? His, mel- his wealth married him to the world, uh, okay? And so, so we started to see something here, right? And so he missed the call of God. And it's so important, you know, many are called, few are chosen. We, we don't want to miss the call of God. So this is, you know, one of the things it says in Mark chapter 10, verse 21, looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, one thing you lack, go and sell what you possess, give to the poor, you will have treasures in heaven and come follow me. And those two words, follow me, when you look at in the Gospels, those were apostolic callings. Peter, James, John, Bartholomew, Nathaniel, Philip, all the disciples, Jesus said, follow me. And so he's literally giving this guy an apostolic calling that the guy didn't want to give up his wealth because he was married to the world through his riches. And we can miss the call of God by having our eyes on temporal things and not eternal things. And it's so important that we don't do that, that we answer the call of God on our own, because there isn't anything that we give up that he's not going to reward us. This guy, I don't know if he made it to heaven or not, but even if he did, he's going to realize that the city of Jerusalem has 12 gates, and each one is named after an apostle. He could have had his name on the eternal gates of a city, of the city, and he missed all of that, right? It's just very, very sad that he missed the call of ministry. And then the next thing in, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 32 through 45, is Jesus starts foretelling about his suffering. And, and here's where we miss the mission, okay? Because can anyone explain to me how these two verses can possibly go together? Verses 34 and 35, look at this. Jesus is saying about himself, they will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise again. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus and said, Teacher, we want you to do for us what we ask of you. Those are like the two most antithetical scripture verses back to back that you can ever find in the scripture. Jesus is saying, listen, I'm going to be spat on. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be whipped. I'm going to be crucified. They're going to kill me. Hey, we want you to do something for us. Right, And we miss the call of mission. The mission, the, the rich young ruler, he missed the call of God. They're missing the mission of God. That it's not about us. It's not a self-focus. And we're always like, God, do this. God, do that. God, I need this. God, I need that. And we miss the mission of Jesus. And and we we just can't have that kind of self-focus. That's one of the reasons we are where we are as a culture. Because we're not doing what God wants us to do. We're in a relationship with him. And then we want him to do for us what we want. And that's just not the way it works. Now, does he love us? And does he answer our prayers? Does he want to bless us? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I found that if you take care of the Lord's business, he'll take care of yours, right? It's just, that's just the way it works. Okay, so then, so then you see this theme going through the, the gospel in chapter 10, and then, it, and then it ends with Bartimaeus receiving his sight, blind Bartimaeus receiving his sight, verses 46 through 52. And you know the story. He sees Jesus, and he starts crying out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You know, heal me. And, uh, and they tell him to shut up, and he gets louder. And they tell him to shut up again, and he gets louder again. And, uh, and finally, Jesus calls him over and heals him. So again, none, nothing happens, happen chance in the Gospels, especially Mark. And so we see divorce affecting children, missing the call of God, missing the mission of God, and Jesus healing somebody because those physical healings were always speaking of a spiritual significance that God wants to open our eyes to spiritual eternal truths. Because when we plug into that, when we drill down into that, that's when we find true contentment and happiness in life. It's getting into God's view of things, right? And so, you know, Leonard Ravenhill once said that God doesn't answer prayer. God answers desperate prayer. Like when your back is against the wall and you are desperate and you cry out to God with everything in you, outstretched prayer to God. 
Um, the, James says the prayer of a righteous person is an outstretched prayer reaching out to God. God really answers desperate prayers. And so this is what Bartimaeus is, is demonstrating. Like he's desperate and Jesus opens his eyes and we pray that Jesus opens our eyes as well because it's so important that that happens. Okay, that's the chapter. In summary, let's bounce back to the first 10 verses and let's look at the teaching on divorce. So it begins in verse 1. Getting up, he went from there to the region of Judea and beyond the Jordan, and crowds gathered around him again. And according to his custom, he once more began to teach them. Some Pharisees came up to Jesus, testing him, and began to question him whether it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife. So here it goes. And he answered them, and he said, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. And Jesus said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote that commandment for from the beginning. So here he's going back. This is, this is where he's going. He's transitioning. He's transitioning from the subject of divorce to the subject of what makes marriage work, because that's much more important, right? And so he's saying it's the hardness of your heart, but from the beginning of creation, he made them male and female. <laughs> As such a lesson for today's culture, right? Uh, like that person in that video saying they can dig up my bones 200 years from now and they're going to know that I was a woman. Um, and so one of, one of the parts of that video that you didn't see that wasn't on there is, is that person said that um, I transitioned at the age of 40. He, he, she said, I got hooked at the age 40. Your children don't stand a chance. You need to be aware of what's going on in your public school systems. If your kids are in public school, you must be engaged, okay? Then Jesus says in verse 7, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and the two will become flesh, and they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God joins together, let no man separate. In the house, the disciples began questioning him about this again. Verse 11, and he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her, and if she herself divorces her husband and marries another man, she is committing adultery also. And so Jesus is kind of breaking away from this whole thing about divorce. He's like, okay, I understand your question, but let's get to the real issue. The real issue is how do we make marriages work to where divorce doesn't even become an issue? That's the most important thing. Rather than wading through those technical terms about divorce and is it legal and how do we do it? And how do we get away with it? Jesus is like, let's talk about building marriages where we don't even have to bring up the subject of divorce. Where do we find that model? It's not Hollywood, right? Do you know that there was one Hollywood marriage that actually set the record? They lasted 56 hours. 56 hours. Like, the longevity just bowls me over. This is cra it's crazy, right? So this isn't, this isn't about a fairy tale. This isn't about happy ever after. This is about happy even after, right? You, you know, when we say I do and then things that happen, I don't. Right. And how do we still navigate those waters? Like somebody said, you know, marriage is a three ring circus. First is the engagement ring, then the wedding ring and then the suffering. And and and, and that's that's, you know, that's that's how it, how it seems to go sometimes. There's, there was this sweet, sweet old couple and they were celebrating their 60th wedding anniversary. Then the guy got up and he said, you know, he goes, after, after 50, after 60 years of marriage to her, she's tried and true. And she didn't hear that well. And she said, after 60 years of marriage, I'm tired of you too. And this past Friday, Darlene and I celebrated 39 years. Um, yeah, so, so awesome. And, uh, you know, I love bugging people. And Darlene is like, you're not happy unless you're bugging somebody. And I'm like, that's true, you know, like I'll be in a sour mood, I'll go home and I'll just start teasing her until she's really ticked and then I, I feel happy. And so, so this is what she got me for our anniversary. Marriage lets you annoy one special person for the rest of your life. I'm like, the gift that keeps on giving, that was just perfect. She said, I saw that in the store and I laughed and laughed and laughed and she said, I just thought of you and had to get it for you. And I'm like, that's that's what it's all about. But, you know, it's really sad that millennials today um, test marriage for two years to see if it's going to work. And it's really sad that six out of ten marriages today end up in divorce. Six out of ten. 
And what's really sad about that is those statistics are not different in the church. Even in the church world, that's what's happening. And I came across another video. And for you young girls, you young women here that, you know, you're, you're not married right now, you've got to hear the wisdom. I've got to think that this is either a mom or a grandmom talking to this young lady. You've got to hear the wisdom. Boom. Man, that last line, ouch, huh? Men don't talk with their words. They talk with their actions, right? And so what great advice to young women. It's like, listen, you know, if they're, if they're not respecting you, if they're not honoring you, then dump them and find somebody else. Just move on. It's not worth it. Paul says this in Ephesians chapter 5. He echoes what Jesus said, echoing what Moses said in the book of Genesis, right? For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother be joined to his wife, the two will become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ in the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you among you also love his own wife, even as himself. The wife must see to it that she respects her husband. A great marriage course, as a matter of fact, I've got a 12-week series on this called Love and Respect out of this. Um, not original material, but it's so powerful talking about how marriages work, right? Uh, men, men need respect, not necessarily romantic, we, we love, men want to be respected, but women do need that love and that emotional connection and feeling like they're part of a team. But why this is so important is because, you know, Jesus and Paul, they're going back to what God said in Genesis, that marriage is about a covenant, covenant. And why is that important? Because God is a covenant-making God. Listen, you have no real, viable assurance of your salvation right now other than the fact that God has sworn himself into an eternal, unchangeable covenant. That's it. You've got nothing else but God's word and covenant. And so God really honors his covenants God honors his covenants, and he wants us to honor our covenants. And so when he's talking about a man leaving his, his, his parents and cleaving to his wife and then becoming one, he's talking about Christ and the church, that that's a covenant that was made between God the Father and God the Son. That's why it's an eternal covenant, that if we come to God through the cross of Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. And that's the only hope that we have is that God keeps his covenant. There's some religions that say, you know, you can never know. You just hope for the best. And when you get there, you'll find out. No, I, I know. I know where my brother is right now. I know where I'm going. I'm hoping for my sister. But I mean, you know, I'm just, just kidding. Just kidding. She loves Jesus. She's going there. We're going to have a grand old time. Um, and, and so, but, but that's it, right? It's just the fact, like, how do I know? How do I really know I'm going to hell? How do you really know? You've got no assurance other than the fact that God keeps his covenant. He swears to his own hurt. Now, God is God, and he's sovereign, and he can do whatever he wants when he wants. But when he covenants, he said, I will not change that. So thank God that we know that tomorrow morning, God's not going to change his mind and says, you know what? I don't think I want to save some of these people, even if they come to me through Christ. No, 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 no. He's bound himself to a covenant. And it's an amazing thing to think that a sovereign God that can do what he wants, when he wants, whenever he wants, binds himself into a covenant and says, this is what I will do for your benefit. Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? And so that's why covenants are so important. Listen, the reason Moses didn't enter in the promised land is because he destroyed a type of the baptism in the Holy Spirit and salvation. Strike the rock and water will flow. Jesus needed to be stricken in order for salvation to come. The second time, speak to the rock. And that's how you're baptized in the Spirit. But no, Moses got mad and he struck the rock again. Jesus doesn't need to be crucified twice. We don't need any other saviors, right? And that's why he destroyed a type of a covenant and was not allowed to enter into the promised land. And so our marriages are a type of our covenant that as Jesus is true to us, when I say yes to a person and that person says yes to me, that is a covenant. Does that mean it's going to be happy ever after? No. Does that mean that there's not going to be stress and trials and arguments? No. That's all part of it. Listen, in the days of sail, when they would build these great big you know, ships, the, the more storms that they went through, 
the more seaworthy that vessel proved itself to be. And so when marriages go through storms and when relationships go through storms, it doesn't mean that that's unnatural. That's what the ship is designed to do. And then we start realizing how seaworthy and how strong and how rugged that relationship is. It's because it's a covenant. Now, listen, God created marriage. There's two things we're going to look at in, in, in closing. Number one is that God created marriage. All right. Before before there was a church, before there was a state or a community, before there were schools, there was marriage. Marriage is primary, it's first, and it's foundational. Because everything else flows out of marriage. Marriage is what creates families. I remember when our kids were little, Janelle and Tim were little, and Darlene and I would get, you know, just give each other a great big hug and when they saw that, they would come running from the other rooms and weasel in between our legs and get into a group hug, right? It was like, we're loving each other, we're hugging each other, but we created a circle and they wanted to be inside that circle. And that's how God works. You know what? God is a trinity. He is a circle of covenanted relationships, a three-in-one God. But Jesus didn't stop there, right? He says, Lord, that, that we are one, that they may be one in us. Jesus draws a circle and brings us into that family of the Trinity. We, we are in the family of God. And this is what marriage is supposed to be. It's supposed to be like a little microcosm of how heaven works and the relationships in heaven works. And so, so, so when we look at the importance of the marriage and the impact it has on family, now we can understand why we as a nation are in trouble. Now, I'll tell you what, man. I absolutely loved President Ronald Reagan, but I did not like the fact that he was the first one when he was governor that signed into law, no fault divorce. You just want to get divorced because you squeeze the toothpaste from the bottom and he squeezes it in the middle. You know, it's like, it's like ridiculous, right? Um, and so I, I really did not appreciate that that came in. Just shows that we're all flawed and we're all, we're all human, right? So this is what Malachi says in chapter 2. Malachi says, take heed then to your spirit and let no one deal treacherously against the wife of your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord God of Israel. Now listen, when God says he hates divorce, it doesn't mean that he hates divorced people, right? We make mistakes because of the hardness of our heart. And sometimes relationships are bad. And when somebody commits uh, adultery, that relationship is broken. When somebody abuses, when somebody abandons, there are biblical reasons for divorce, and we understand that. But what's happening here is that we need to understand that what God loves, Satan hates. And what Satan hates, God loves. So if God hates divorce, that means God loves marriage. And if God loves marriage, that means Satan hates marriage. And Satan fights against marriage. Now, I'm going to say something, and I know you're going to take it wrong, and you're going to go run into Darlene. That's not what I mean at all, okay? But, but listen, listen. Isn't it ironic that Satan never appeared on the scene until after a woman was created? No, 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 don't go there. No, that's not. Why? Because he understood that when God created everything, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. I'm going to bring the other half. I'm going to bring the helper from out of him, and they're going to be joined in one, and they're going to be a representation of a trinity to become, or at least a, a duplicity to becoming one. My spirit in with them now creates another trinity, and they're going to be a solid, cohesive unit, man and woman in marriage. And the Bible begins with a wedding in Genesis and ends with a wedding in Revelation. Right? So we can see the heartbeat of God towards marriage and why marriage is so, so important. Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She will be called woman because she was taken out of the man. God says, listen, I, I, you know, I created man and I paraded all the animals before him. And he named all of those animals, but there was not a companion for the man. And so God took out of the man and created the woman. And, and, and I, I know how that worked. I know how that name came to be because Adam woke up from that anesthesia and he looked around and he saw Eve and he was like, oh man, like that's where that name came from. 
And, and so that's how it all began. And so, you know, the Garden of Eden, we're not talking about Neverland or fairy tale land or Camelot or anything like that. No, it was a real place and it was good and it was perfect, but man alone was not good. And so God created a helper for the two of them to reach their full potential. It doesn't mean that being single is wrong. And there are people that are called to be single for the sake of the kingdom of God. But I'm just talking about marriage because it's something that the enemy fights so hard against. Because he wants to destroy anything that comes from the heart of God. Anything that's created in the image of God. And so there's such a fight and a struggle against marriage. Now, one of the reasons is, is because, you know, until recently, like really, like since the late 80s, maybe the 90s, we never really understood the neurological differences between men and women. Like there are different, we, know, we understand biological differences, right? Men have a denser bone structure. Men have a lot more muscle structure, especially upper body mass and upper body strength. Um, you know, women obviously have the capacity of, 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 uh, of creating life and, and giving birth and all this kind of, we know that there's biological differences, but the neurological differences are what really make the difference because men and women are totally two different people. And like, sometimes we would say like, why would God take like, what would seemingly be polar opposites and put them together and say, now you're in this relationship till death do you part. And, and it's like, it does make you think about death a little bit, doesn't it? And so, so, and the reason, the reason is because God wants us to learn his unconditional love. See, God agapes, and that means unconditional love. There's a lot of words in the Greek for the word love, right? Uros and phileo and different words for love. But agape is unconditional love. That means that no matter what happens, you, 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 you love that other person. So no matter how much I bugged Arlene, she's got to love me. That's actually where the fun comes in. So, so, so she's back there and I'm watching words very carefully. Um, so there's differences. There's so much differences. Like, like guys, I know guys are absolutely fearful of therapy. Like guys do not want to go to counseling. That's why I do a lot of coaching. Guys love coaching because it's all about creativity and moving forward. But guys are so fearful of therapy. And I'll tell you what, guys, you don't have to be. And do you know why? Because when a therapist asks you to go back in a childhood, you're already there, right? <laughs> like all the women are like, yeah, that is so true. That is like spot on. But there are, there are absolutely, totally, the wiring of our brains are not the same. Like, like one, like one is, is PC and one is Mac, right? I mean, there's just differences. In the, so a man's brain is usually much more analytical, much more problem solving, much more compartmentalized, much more nonverbal, quiet problem solvers that need respect. So when you're, so when, so like women, when you go to your husband and say, oh, do you, I want to talk to you. Do you know what we hear? There's a problem I'm going to have to fix. That's what we hear. And you're like, you're thinking like, no, I just want to be able to unload so that we can be one. And they're like, that ain't going to be one at all. Because now, you know, what's going to happen. I'm going to have to withdraw so that I can think this through and solve this problem. And then when he withdraws, the woman feels that, and she's like, no, 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 and she starts going after him, and then you get this chase around the house. <laughs> Guys, I don't know, I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm alone in this. I will be downstairs by the furnace that's running. Darlene will be up in the bathroom when I hear this, and I know she's talking to me, but I'm like, do you not know I cannot hear you? Because see, now she's going to hold me accountable for something she said. And I'm like, it's a lose-lose situation, right? And so, so, <laughs> so, so guys are like, like women, women, you are so much more multitasking. Like there, there, there's like, like a guy has, a guy has a little box. He's got, a guy is like a waffle iron. And if we're in this little box, that's the box we're in. Women are like spaghetti. Everything's touching everything else. It is like shorting fuses. And we're over here like in a little box. 
And that's where we live. And you're, you're much more multitasking. You're much more verbal. A lot of the thought processes of women go through the speech center. It just is what it is because they have a need to feel connected, to feel like they're part of a team. Like I'm here to help me. I'm here in your corner, but I've got to be involved. I've got it. That's why. How did your day go? And guys are like, eh. I, you know, another day, another dollar, right? It's like, but no, they want to feel loved in that communication. It's in there. Listen, a, a woman, a woman can be making dinner. She's making a batch of spaghetti sauce, right? She's making the batch of spaghetti sauce. The phone is over here. She's talking to the doctor about making an appointment for one kid. She's watching the little one over there on the stroller, making sure that they're safe. She's also thinking about school projects that need to be done. She's thinking about the laundry, the ironing, right? Like all this stuff all the same time. She's going on all the same time. Women, do you know what guys do? We're stirring a pot of spaghetti and we're like, wow, look how those bubbles come up. It looks like little mini volcanoes, like poof, poof, right? That is the truth. That is like, that is the God's honest truth of how these things work. So another, another short video on, on the differences between uh, men and women. So, so basically, Jesus is talking about two things that we have to do, leave and cleave. Right? It's kind of simple. We have to leave and we have to cleave. We have to, we have to be committed to one another until death do us part. And that word leave literally means abandoned. Now, when we hear that word abandoned, we, well, most of us think about that, that, you know, abandoned ship, right? Like get out. And this is what it's talking about. We have to leave our old family structure, even though it's going to be in tow. <laughs> I love doing premarital coaching with couples because I said, listen, it's not about you loving you and coming together it's you bringing a bag of baggage with you, and it's you bringing a great big bag of baggage with you, and then throwing those all together and seeing what's going to come out of that, right? Because family structures are different. I mean, if one comes from a family structure where everyone's was like really loud and boisterous and over-talking one another, and then the other one comes from a family that's very soft and quiet and polite, and then you, start, you try to bring that together, right? There's going to be differences, there's going to be huge differences. And so this is what he's talking about. You got to leave, you got to cleave to make a new family unit. And that's the cool thing about it is you get to structure your new family unit and preferably on the teachings of Christ and on the word of God. You come into that marriage that way. The new family takes precedent over all other family relationships, period. The wife honors the husband. The husband loves the wife beyond family structures. It doesn't mean that you throw your family away. Obviously, families are necessary and needed and good, but it just means that you become a new identity and now you become a husband and wife and start all over again. It's, it's like the poor guy that was, you know, he, 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 would, he would be out there in the dating world and he'd meet a girl and bring, him, bring her home to mom and mom didn't like her. And he'd go date another girl and bring her home to mom and mom didn't like her. And that went on and on and on. Every girl he ever met the mom did not like. And so finally he found this girl that looked like his mom, sounded like his mom, and thought like his mom, and brought her home, and the father didn't like her. <laughs> that's, that's, that's just not right. Um, so, so really, it's, it's, it's really about a friendship. We put too much emphasis on romance. We watch too many romance movies. We, we put that emphasis on, you know, and, and if you ever watch those Hallmark, <laughs> Darlene would be like, you want to watch a Christmas Hallmark? And I'm like, you know, I'm pretty sure the girl's going to go to a new city, take a new job that she can't do. She's going to meet some farmer guy that he helps her out, and then they're going to fall in love, right? I mean, you know, you, you can only tweak that so many times. And, and so it's like, but yeah, sure, I'll watch it with you because... Husbands, love your wives. It's Christ, you know, it's not like going to the cross, but pretty close. <laughs> but it really is about friendship. Darlene and I were friends before we moved into a relationship. It's really about becoming friends first and knowing that person and loving that person for who they are and becoming friends. Because it's not just about being lovers. It's not just about being roommates or business partners. It's about being friends. And so Malachi says this, going back to Malachi again, he says, Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your companion 
and your wife by covenant. And so she's a companion, guys. She's a companion, one that you are united with in thoughts and in plans and in efforts and in dreams. That's why marry a Christian, right? Get, get, you know, the Bible even says don't be unequally yoked. Um, because what, what fellowship will there be? So that's so important, right? And, uh, and, and listen, this is, this is what he says about, about this whole marriage thing together. He says, listen, he goes, if you don't get this right, look what Peter says about this in First Peter. You husbands in the same way live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker. Now, that doesn't mean inferior. It means somebody, it, it means, it means, something weaker, something fragile, like the difference between a styrofoam coffee cup and a fine china glass or, or china teacup or something, right? The, the one is weaker because it's more valuable. And that's what he's trying to get across here. He says, so live with your wives in the same way, in an understanding way as somebody weaker, more fragile, more valuable, since she's a woman, and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers won't be hindered. You see, the thing about marriage is Jesus said, if any two gather on earth is touching anything, there I am in the midst, right? And so God creates this two partnership that when we come together in prayer, we already have that covenantal promise that God is in our prayers. He's saying, if you don't respect your wife and live with her in a manner of, of, of you know, loving her and making sure she's part of that team, your prayers are going to be hindered. I, you know, how many times have I heard people say, I don't pray anymore because I prayed and nothing ever happened? Well, what's the relationship at home like? How is that working at home? He says, listen, live with your wife. Some translations use the word dwell. And in the Greek, it literally means giving service to or giving maintenance to. Okay, because now we're talking to guys, right? Giving maintenance to. Now, guys, you all remember, you know, you finally bought that vehicle you wanted, not the one that you could only afford, right? Well, we start off by buying what we can afford to get us around, and then we get a little more comfortable, and then we buy that truck that we've always wanted, or that car that we've always wanted. And when we get that thing, we're like, I've never eaten in that thing. I'm never going to eat food in that truck. I'm going to wash that truck every week. I'm going to service maintain that thing, oil change every year. Check the tire. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be all over that truck. I'm gonna be taking care of that truck. I'm gonna take care of it like you wouldn't believe. And then a year goes by, right? No oil change. Interior looks like a dumpster. Tires are bald. And then you're thinking, I need to get a new truck. And this is what happens, right? Here's the deal. Listen, here's the deal. If you maintain dwell with, maintain that vehicle, it turns into a classic. You don't even need to register it anymore. It, be, it has that, you know, it becomes a classic. I remember years ago when I, I got a car, I mean, I was just happy to be able to get a car. You know, I got a car, it was a Ford Pinto. And I remember driving down a road, I love my Ford Pinto. And one day, you know, the thing, and I'm driving down the road and all of a sudden I feel something on my head. And I look in the mirror and the cloth on the interior separated and just came down on my head like a parachute. And I'm like, okay. So I got home and took an X-Acto knife and cut that out, but I still love my car, right? And then I remember one day driving down a highway and, and some kind of plug blew off the manifold. I'm literally like, I hear this bang and I see a big dent in my hood and then I hear this blah, 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 blah. and I'm like, right, get that fixed, you know? I'm like, this is a classic. I get to work one day and I hear this because I'm driving in, bumper fell off and was dragging. I tied it up with clothesline. I'm like, whoa. One day I took my motorcycle into work. Darlene and I were living at a mobile home park in Kittery, and I drove my motorcycle into work. I get a call halfway through. It's the park maintenance, and I said, hey, uh, the horn in your car just decided to go off, and it got really irritating, so I opened the hood and pulled the wires. And I'm like, sweet. Like, this thing is a classic. This thing is classic. And so now, like when Darlene, when I do something and Darlene's horn goes off, and it's like, wah, 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 right? I'm like, classic. Classic. That's totally awesome. And guys, this is why your cars 
have idiot lights. You know what those are? The little oil light comes on. They call them idiot lights because it's saying, idiot, you haven't checked your oil in so long that it's in a dangerous place. Or the tire pressure comes on. Idiot light. You probably have 15 pounds of pressure in one of your tires right now. You don't even know, right? So in marriage, there's these little idiot lights. We call it nagging. But in reality, it's like idiot light. Pay some attention to this need. Husbands, dwell with. Love your wives. Dwell with them and make them classics. Turn them in to classics because that's what it's all about. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, see to it that you respect your husbands. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in the midst of laughing, we um, also see the truth of the importance of marriage. And Lord, I pray for every single person here this this morning that's married, those that are listening uh, online, uh, that that if their if their marriage is waning a little bit, Lord, I pray there are so many avenues of getting help, getting counsel, getting coaching. I pray that we invest in our marriages the way we need to invest. I pray, God, that you would help us be better husbands and better wives, more understanding, more uh, compassionate, more slow to anger, slow to speak, uh, and that you would just heal struggling marriages because, God, you love marriage. And Satan hates our marriages. Satan would love us to dissolve and to to disintegrate and to blow up family units that eventually blow up communities, that eventually blow up regions and even whole nations. And so, God, we pray that you would reinstill the sanctity of marriage, the blessedness of marriage, the hope of marriage, and, and the fact that there's nothing that brings greater joy in longevity than marriage. And so bless each person here today, God. And we thank you for all of these things in Jesus' matchless name. And everyone said amen and amen and amen. God bless you. Hey.